Well, I think we're going to get started here. So uh, I'm going to uh, welcome you to the Stafford County Museum Library. I appreciate everybody coming in here today. And I want to point out that my uh, board members have made refreshments in the back, and you're all welcome to help yourselves to those. And also, I'd like for you to take a moment to silence your cell phones. And um, now I'll introduce Lynn. And uh, Linda Beck Fenwick is an attorney emerita in Texas, Georgia, and North Carolina, and was an adjunct professor of law at Baylor University. Uh, Fenwick is an award winning author of Should the Children Pray? A Historical, Judicial, and Political Examination of Public School Prayer and Private Choices. Public Consequences, Reproductive Technology, and the New Ethics of Conception, Pregnancy, and Family. And both of these books are available for on-site use here in our museum library. And now I would just like to turn the floor over to Lynn. Well, this is um, exciting to me uh, to see you all here on a pretty Sunday afternoon <laughs> instead of out enjoying it. I hope I, I make up for that, I think I will, um, because I want to brag on those of you who are members of the board, everybody likes to be bragged on, and I'm sincere in doing this, and on your director, and on the value of small community uh, museums. I could not have written this book without the small community uh, museums and libraries that I have used. Uh, for starters, this Stafford County history that you are probably all well familiar with, uh, on the, uh, down in the corner of the page, there was a reference to a book that Lucille Hall had found. And um, my mother had passed away. I was named the executor of her estate and I was in Kansas by myself as Larry was going back and forth. And um, I thought, well, this is a great time to do some genealogy research. While I'm up here, I can go to the courthouses and so forth. And I saw this little corner of the page that said something about a journal kept by a homesteader. And then there was another little paragraph at the top of the next page, and it mentioned some names. And I had a couple of ancestors mentioned in that little message, which I'm, I'm uh, sure that Lucille wrote. And so I, I thought, well, that, that, that helped me with my genealogy. Where in the world would that be? Because she had passed away. So I started asking around, asking around. And I'm so glad that lady I want to tell the story on is here today. <laughs> because um, I called and they didn't know whether they had it, but they said, well, Lynn, there are a lot of boxes in that basement that have never been opened since we packed things up at Lucille's. And so uh, you are welcome to come and look. Well, I, I went soon, if not the next day, and I felt guilty because there are probably not very many people around anymore that could recognize photographs. And because Lucille was family, she and my father were first cousins. They were born five days apart, and so whenever Daddy went to St. John, he checked in on Lucille and her mother. And um, so I was working my way down the shelves in this one little small uh, room, and guilt would strike me, and I would say, oh, I need to write down a note that, that it's so-and-so. Um, and it took me all day, and I was down to the last box and I think I'd even pulled off the tape. And uh, they came in and they said, we're leaving, but you're welcome to stay. Now, these are the things you need to switch off, and these are the things you need to leave on, and don't touch this one. And I said, uh, I'm, I'm out of here with you. Uh, so the next morning, the phone rings, and that was when we still had a phone at the farm and not cell phones. And this excited person is on the phone and I can't figure out who it is or what she's saying and what she was saying is we found the journal and so that's how the journal came to me so for starters without that book which was produced by all of you or some of you 
I would never have known that the journal existed. And then um, I got the book and I started reading it and I realized immediately that Isaac Werner's journal was more important than just to lift out a few names about my ancestors. Um, and so that is, that is the heart of the book. And I used uh, a lot of resources from other museums. Um, and I'll just very quickly, a lot of the museums in this region, especially in the 1970s and 1980s, were writing centennial books. And so uh, the St. John Centennial, A History in Progress, Maxville, Kansas, Community History, 1886 to, to 1986, Panorama of Progress, 1872, 1972, that was Larned, Pratt, Kansas, A Centennial View, and then there were three books that uh, were written by individual authors. Uh, Pioneer Saints and Sinners by J. Rufus Gray, who was uh, uh, from Pratt, Saratoga, Kansas by Lucille Asher. I don't know whether any of those names sound familiar to you. And Saratoga is a disappeared town. And it was, it was an important community. They had a mill and they had a brick maker. And so a lot of their buildings were brick. And it was just north of where the Pratt Fish Hatchery is. Uh, and it had a head start on Pratt. Uh, and uh, Saratoga and um, Ayuka were fighting over who was going to get the county seat. And uh, along came these investors from out of town, and they established Pratt, which they called Pratt Center, because they wanted to make a point of that their town was in the center of the county. Oh. Um, and when Pratt Center um, got finally was chosen, Ayuka was the county, temporary county seat for a long time. When uh, Ayuka finally lost and Pratt Center was chosen, the first thing they did was drop the center. They didn't need that anymore once they had uh, the county seat. Um, Lynn, what was the name of your ancestor that you found their homestead? Well, I, I have three ancestors that are in Isaac's journal. The Hall family who lived on the creek, the Beck family who lived just west of Isaac, and the Wilson family, who's uh, my grandmother's side of the family. So there are three of my ancestors that are in fact in the book. Okay. The journal that you found in the box was that the only copy of the journal, or was that a copy of the journal? It was the journal. And the journal is 480 pages. Uh, it is oversized, like you would go to the courthouse and find... Um, <laughs> yes. That's the real journal. My publicist <laughs> is showing you my book. That's the real journal, 480 pages. And it's, it's big, you know, it's about 18 inches tall and about three it's the kind you'd find in the courthouse deeds records things like that but that's the actual journal he wrote in he he wrote neatly but he i think he um, sometimes i suspect he was running out of ink and those are the faded pages that are hard to read i think maybe he knew he was about out of it and he'd water it uh, and it wasn't like they had laid open in the sun or anything because it had um, it would be kind of a series of pages, and then he must have been able to get to town, and the ink gets better again. Um, but even though his penmanship was very nice, uh, it, he, he was trying to save his paper, I guess, and so he wrote almost from the edge of the paper to the binding. Um, the edge of the paper, he kept kind of a little uh, tabulation of what the articles were, so if he wanted to go back and check on when he planted his corn, he would have maybe written in, in the edge, planted corn. Uh, but it is it is an amazing document. Where the is it now? Uh, well, it belongs to the Lucille M. Hall uh, Museum in St. John, and to uh, their uh, wonderful uh, people who keep that going came over here today to hear. 
So that's that is where the ownership is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the third book that was written by a local resident is titled Belpre, Kansas, The Story of a Small Town. I was careless because, he, I mean, I used the book. Uh, the author is in the bibliography. The footnotes re respect the, the sources of my material. The other two writers were dead, and I just assumed he was. And I just found out from being uh, in St. John um, that someone in the audience said, came up and quietly told me, no, he is still living. And yesterday I had a long telephone conversation with him. And uh, he's actually younger than I am, <laughs> which is kind of disturbing. But uh, it, it was, uh, an ex he was excited. Uh, it's, uh, his name is David M. Kearney. He, he was from uh, Belfry. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a thank you, especially to this museum and this community and the St. John community, but to a lot of communities because they are the sources of saving our history. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk to you about is the particular places in the book where I relied on information that was available to me really only because of these museums, or at least largely because of them. Um, I'll read you the quote first, and then I'll explain how where I learned about it. Early Sunday morning on July the 3rd, Isaac heard anvil shooting in Maxville, the loud ringing sound, the traditional means for calling out celebration. The ringing was capable of being heard at Isaac's home, a distance of 14 miles. The local blacksmith was usually the one called upon to shoot the anvil. Shooting required two anvils, each weighing 100 pounds or more, with about half a pound of black powder secured to the base of each. With one anvil base facing upward, a fuse was then laid on the powder and a second anvil placed on top, base to base. The fuse was ready to be lit to ignite the black powder. The eardrum aching explosion would send the top anvil soaring 150 feet or more into the sky ringing as if pounded by some heavenly smithy. <clears throat> now, the reason, honestly, come to think of it, the reason that we were uh, attending the Santa Fe Trail celebration was because Doug Lamb had a car entered in it, and we went to uh, see Doug in his car, but we enjoyed touring the, the wonderful museum that they have there in North of Larned, and they shot an anvil. Oh. And I don't know whether any of you have ever heard it, but my description is genuine. It is loud. And um, after it was over, I had begun to read. Uh, I spent 11 months transcribing the journal. So I was pretty familiar <laughs> with the journal. And I remembered shooting the anvil. And so I went up to the people who had done that. And I asked them, explain to me how you do this. And they not only explained to me, they gave me a piece of paper with the instructions, which I kept, and they are footnoted in the book uh, for having guided me to that explanation. How much of a charge did it take between the two animals? I don't know the answer to that, but I did leave out the peanut butter part. <laughs> no. Today, today, to hold it in place the, the, uh, when they light the wick, they use peanut butter. Uh, I don't know what they used back at the time that Isaac heard the animals, but uh, I don't think it was probably peanut butter. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about are the old newspapers, and there they are. Um, I spent, I really for quite a while spent more time with Michael and Isaac than I did with my husband. Uh, he, he was an understanding man to be abandoned by me for two other men, but we, we, we did okay. 
Uh, I stood for days and days and days back at that table, turning the actual brittle, fragile, yellow pages like this all the way over. And this is one of my favorite pages. And Michael has been kind enough to get it out and put it up so he can prop it up and uh, show you. A lot of the people that were new to the prairie did not speak English, or they were just beginning to speak English because they came from other places. Isaac himself spoke German um, as well as English because, uh, and apparently Werner was Werner, because in one newspaper uh, it was spelled that way. And so political cartoons were a good way to convey a message in the populist movement for those who couldn't read the text. Um, and this is one of my favorites. And I think I figured out why. When I was a little girl, this was one of my toys. And this is exactly what the cartoonist has used to say that the wealthy people manipulate America and their newspapers. And so I that is I just love that and I suspect it's my Those of you who have uh, seen me speak when I have the PowerPoint, the PowerPoint gets to be the thing that keeps I'm me on track. I'm in meeting right now. So I apologize for having notes to try to keep me keep me on track here. Um, old books are especially important and without museums a lot of those books would not be available possibly online but not uh, not necessarily available to just go and have in your hand. Um, I'm going to again I'm going to read a short uh, section from the book and then I will explain why I chose that. Isaac was not a non-believer. He had been raised in a religious family, in a community in which the old Haynes Church had been the center of society from the earliest days. One of his sisters was a minister's wife, the other the daughter-in-law of a minister, and he utilized Cruden's concordance in his own Bible study. His library contained other Christian books, among them Henry Ward Beecher's Life of Jesus Christ, and John Milton's Paradise Lost. He was impatient with ill-educated, long-winded preachers whose sermons delivered little spiritual substance. However, what he currently found most objectionable were clergymen who used their influence to mislead congregations about non-spiritual subjects. In particular, he objected to those preachers who were speaking against the Alliance, that's the Farmers Alliance parading their opinions as divinely received truth. Um, I thought it would be very telling for me to be able to look at the Cruden's Concordance and see just what kind of a book it was. And uh, so I ordered one online, and it was a reprinted piece of junk that was on such terrible paper that the ink blurred around them. It was just illegible. And they had run it off the sides of the pages. So you, you kind of, it was terrible. So I thought, well, um, it, my research shows me that a lot of families had Prudence Concordance in their home to use for their own study at home of the Bible. Maybe the museum has a copy of Prudence Concordance. And so indeed they did. And if you can open it. Just anywhere? Just anywhere. Mm. Look at the print. I mean, anybody that bought this and used it to study the Bible, first of all, had to have good eyes. <laughs> and second of all, had to be taking this Bible study very, very seriously. So uh, as you read, you will find that Isaac was sometimes annoyed uh, with, with some of the... Um, local ministers that 
didn't really study the Bible as much as they just like to be up in front of people talking. Um, and um, it, it, uh, it showed that he was serious about his Bible study or he wouldn't have had that book. Hmm. If, if you have a librarian that you really respect, you know how helpful it is to have a good librarian. And I know that um, there are some very good librarians in our region. Um, last week we, we worked with a, a great one in St. John. And, um, Friday night I'm going to be speaking here, and uh, I've been working with your librarian here. So um, you are fortunate. Uh, in this area, and there are some wonderful libraries in this area. Um, but um, a librarian, when you go in and you ask for, do you have such and such, they can usually go to the index, and if you can't remember the name, then they can look at the index for the subject. If you walk in here, uh, you uh, sometimes stumble in with a vague kind of a uh, you think you might have and the importance of a director that knows the contents of his museum is invaluable and you guys have such a person Stafford, yes. Stafford County is very very lucky that, uh, that you have Michael and I was very very lucky when I was doing my research so I'm very Pleased with that. And now I'm going to read something to you again and then explain to you why I've chosen that. As Isaac's health worsened, G.G. John began calling on him daily and built an invalid chair for Isaac, similar to the one Isaac had built for Frank Curtis years before. Doc Dix called on Isaac when he was in the community, offering what medical relief he could. However, without the daily attendance of G.G. John, Isaac could not have remained in his home. G.G. John was nearly two decades younger than Isaac, having come to Kansas from Virginia. He and his family lived on Persis Fosberg's old place just to the west of Isaac's timber claim, a handy walk to Isaac's house. The younger man was quite a scholar and enjoyed browsing among Isaac's books and discussing philosophy. Okay, G.G. John. I wanted to know more about G.G. John, this kind younger man who helped Isaac to stay in his home a little bit longer. Well, the first thing that I did when I transcribed the journal was to go to Ancestry.com and look up every single person named in the journal. So I have a book about this thick with the ancestor history from Amazon.com of everybody. Uh, if you have family that you discover, then uh, not all of you had family in the community at that time, but if some of you did, um, I, I probably uh, know a little bit about, or at least once I knew about it, and it's still in the book, that was a lot of things to remember. Uh, I had also uh, interviewed his would be his uh, grand niece and grand nephew. That would Joan Moody and Milton Mason John in St. John. I had interviewed them. I interviewed a lot of older people. The sad truth is I didn't get to everybody, and now they're gone. Uh, I worked on this manuscript from starting the, transcribing the journal for a decade, and a decade is a long time. Uh, and I didn't get to some of them uh, soon enough. But I had done a lot of research at that point, and I had spent a lot of time with Michael here. And one day, he came down from somewhere, I don't know where he came from, came walking out, and I was working, and he said, I don't know whether there's anything in here that is going to interest you or not, but it's your family, and I thought you might like to see it, even if there's not anything in here interesting. Uh, in, in terms of applying to your research. And 
this is what he brought down. And I looked at it, and it, it was my great aunt, uh, Anna Marie, but Anna Marie Beck, uh, but we all called her Auntie. And uh, Auntie was a fixture in St. John. I think most of the people who would recognize her name now are gone, but she was a school teacher until her hearing uh, got bad and it didn't work very well to try to corral kids when you couldn't hear well. And so then she was elected the county superintendent of schools for Stafford County. And then her hearing just went to nothing. And she worked in Topeka in the education department. Um, and then finally came back and uh, lived out her life in St. John. And I was interested, but I didn't really think I had found much. And then I found um, a clipping. She made a mistake. She cut around the edge of the clipping, so I do not know the date and I do not know the newspaper. But there was a book review of a book that was written by J.J. John, G.G. John, excuse me. And um, it was a book on philosophy. So I knew what I had found about him in Ancestry.com when he was born, that he came here from Virginia, those kinds of things. Uh, his great nephew said he vaguely remembered the house, and it was more like a southern house with porches all around it. So that was interesting. But what I discovered is what I read to you, the last sentence in my paragraph. The younger man was quite a scholar and enjoyed browsing among Isaac's books and discussing philosophy. And I think that one little simple thing that came out of this scrapbook brought him to life a lot better. Um, Isaac raised primarily potatoes and corn, and he would load up his wagon and uh, travel to towns to sell it. Now, Isaac, I believe from the journal, there was a gap in the journal. He wrote in it when he was a young druggist in Illinois, uh, in 1870, 1871, and then there is this 14-year gap, and he resumed writing in it after he was settled on the prairie in 1884 and wrote until, um, until he filled all 480 pages and he was already ill. Um, but um, he didn't have a horse and he lived on the pratt Stafford County line. And until he had a horse, he walked to St. John. Uh, so I think he came to Kansas and staked his claim in about 1877. So uh, in the very beginning, uh, there is a gap. He finally got a horse, um, and getting the horse was the first time he went into debt. Debt was a real problem for a lot of the settlers. And Isaac managed to stay out of debt until he finally decided that he was never going to make much of a farm if he didn't have a horse. And when he got his horse, then he went into debt some more uh, by buying a wagon. And um, I could picture the wagon. Do you know why? Because I have been across the street. And I have seen this wagon on display over there. And that's and Isaac's. That's no, Isaac's. no, this it's isn't Isaac's. Isaac's. It's, it's just, it's, yeah. I believe, from the description, it was probably similar to this. I also found uh, Shaler's uh, hardware in St. John. Uh, they also had an ad with a wagon in, pictured in their ad. So between the two things, I could picture Isaac going off with his, um, and we'll put this on the table if you want to come up after and look at these things more closely. I can picture that now uh, as I was describing him when he went all the way down into Barber County to sell his, uh, his potatoes and his uh, corn. And when he went to Cullison to sell them, and he was actually in Cullison the very day that the train tracks were laid and reached the edge of Cullison. Um, so all of these little details that museums have helped me picture what I was writing about um, 
are, are very, very important to the book. Um, obviously, the crown jewel of photographs in this museum are the glass plate negatives, and um, that uh, uh, did not, unfortunately, help me with Isaac because the Gray Studio did not exist at the time Isaac was alive. But I do know that he had two studio portraits taken, one in Pratt and one in uh, St. John. I don't know what happened to them since he never married and never had children, uh, but I do know that he mailed them to his uh, siblings. And I've tried, they've tried hard, and I did, um, Larry and I went to Wernersville. Isaac's father founded the town of Wernersville, Pennsylvania. And um, we went there, and when I spoke at Fort Hayes State, when we had the book launch and the virtual, uh, everybody coming together virtually, his, uh, his, Isaac's father's brother's descendants uh, came virtually to that, and we met when we were actually in Wernersville, we met, met Jim Werner, who is 93, Three. I believe, 93 years old. He was, that was probably his first virtual experience uh, to come to the book launch, but he was there. He was very generous to share some of his research with me as I was working on the book. Um, he shared a picture so that I have a picture of Isaac's brother in the book. But um, uh, I, I, I know Isaac had a really pretty farm. It was beautiful. Uh, in fact, the newspaper writer uh, said after visiting the farm, he visited probably the prettiest farm in Stafford County. Hmm. So it was very, very special. And he, Isaac was a photographer. And he didn't have any equipment, but he met a neighbor who did. And... Um, that neighbor began to come to Isaac's home every Sunday so that people could gather there and have their pictures taken. And sometimes the photographer would go to their homes and take the pictures, but some of their homes were kind of shabby. Mm. And so they would come and pose at Isaac's farm, and Isaac had a beautiful grove with a promenade. He mm. planted his trees so it had a promenade. That's what he called it, and um, I suspect strongly, even though I've mentioned many times on my blog, if you have old pictures of your family in Stafford County, I would love to see them. Nobody has taken me up on that. Um, I suspect there are families who have these old pictures from the late 1800s, and they're so proud of their family's beautiful farm, and it may be Isaac's. Uh, because so many families came there. Uh, one other example, I'm going to brag on another director uh, who's no longer at the museum in Pratt, but uh, this, this woman was so remarkable. Her name is Marsha Brown, and I went down there and did some research. Marsha was kind of precious about her uh, copy, uh, about her, uh, oh, we look up things online, only not online. What do you call that? Uh, well, you get the, the tapes and you... Oh, the microfilm. Yeah, the microfilm. She had a brand new microfilm machine and she, she wouldn't let anybody use it. But she'd sit there with you and help you use it. But other than that, I have no complaints. This gal is a walking history encyclopedia for Pratt County. Her idea of a good time is to go out to cemeteries and write down the uh, people in the, the small cemeteries. And another thing that she did was so special. When the, uh, when the, uh, yes, when the Pratt Library had a, a deacquisition sale, uh, she discovered one of Isaac's books in one of the old books. And it has his name in it, I know his handwriting, and the date that he bought the book, and she bought it and gave it to me. So when I give back, <laughs> and no longer can turn the pages on his journal, I have his book, and that's pretty special to me. 
The other amazing thing that she did, I, when I was down there doing the research, uh, my brain was talking about two things to me at the same time, so I didn't forget them. That's why I was messing up. Um, I was uh, looking for pictures of people who would have been his neighbors or his contemporaries. And she would, I knew she would know if she did, and she said, no, but I have this box of unlabeled photographs, and you can look through all of them. So I spent an afternoon looking through these pictures and found nothing, except in, you know, interesting old pictures. Months later, I get an email from her, and Marcia says, was Doc Dix one of the people you mentioned? And I said, yes. She said, well, somebody just brought in a box of photographs, and Doc Dix is one of those photographs. Would you like to have me copy it for you? And Doc Dix's picture is in the book. Um, that, is, that is what makes museum directors amazing and so valuable to the community. One last thing, it's kind of a sad thing that I chose to end on. Uh, when I was across the street uh, looking at that museum, it isn't all vehicles, although there is the hearse, which is pretty impressive. But the thing that moved me the most was the baby's Caskets. tiny little casket. It was very, very hard on women and children. It was hard on the men too. They worked hard in, in bad climate situations, but um, there were so many babies that didn't make it very long at all. And sometimes there were mothers who didn't make it after a childbirth, and if mother didn't make it, the odds were not good for the baby. And uh, if you have looked in these country cemeteries, or even some of the town cemeteries, uh, if you see a, a young woman's grave, you can kind of look around, and the odds are pretty strong that you may see an infant as well. Um, so that, that particular thing in this museum um, really moved me because I, Isaac wrote so many times about women who had died in childbirth and um, had, uh, had lot, you know, the family would try to keep the baby alive, but it was hard. Um, there is a, another sad story. <clears throat> Isaac is buried in Neyland Cemetery, which is a wonderful old cemetery. If there's a pretty afternoon someday and you just want to uh, see a little history, uh, wonderful, interesting graves, and, um, and a good way to be reminded what your ancestors and my ancestors did um, to bring us about and to, to build this community. And there is a very large stone uh, just steps from Isaac's, and it is a stone for two little girls. Their last name was Davison. The story, I learned the story in the, um, the county history uh, book, and then I went looking for the actual graves, or I saw it and remembered the story. People lived in dugouts, and they lived in sod homes. Sometimes their sod home had cheap wooden shingles on it, which was pretty scary when there was a prairie fire. Um, but sometimes they simply built some kind of a substructure and their roof was sawed as well as the walls being sawed. And these two little girls lived in a sawed house with their parents and a heavy, 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 heavy rain went on and on and on and the sawed roof soaked up so much water that it caved in. The little girls' names, so you can all remember these sweet little girls that didn't get to grow up. Uh, Buena Vista was one little girl's name. I think she was three. And Bessie May, and Bessie May was only a few months old. We are all owing 
to the people who came and confronted. I haven't taught, what I've been talking about are our, our wonderful museums, and you can learn much more than what I've shared with you today, um, and thank heavens for those of you who serve and keep these things open. Um, but what I wanted to do with this book, uh, and it was hard, uh, I did not want to write a textbook. I did the research as if it were a scholarly book, but I wanted to write a book for all of you. I wanted to write a book that reads like a novel. Um, I think once you get immersed into it, um, people have told me that they're, they're pretty fond of Isaac. Uh, one of my friends told me that she was furious that I let Isaac die. <laughs> and she put the book down and didn't read it again for a while. Uh, but that's the way I wanted to tell you the story of what your predecessors, and maybe maybe you uh, came to Stafford County a little bit later uh, when you weren't quite, your ancestors weren't quite fighting uh, prairie fires. But um, I wanted to put you in that moment and understand how hard it was and what an amazing thing that they did and uh, and the things that they suffered to, to manage to, to get it accomplished. And I, uh, I hope I have done that. I wrote, I wrote the books so you could read it and maybe you could pass it to your children and your grandchildren and that a few generations hence it would still be in somebody's library and it, those people who did such courageous things won't be forgotten. Thank you. If any of you have brought books that you already own, I'm glad to sign them. If any of you own books and forgot to bring them, I have some book plates that I would be glad to sign, and then you can take them home and put them in your book. And there are some books here um, if you uh, haven't bought a book and you want to. Thank you all so much for listening. Yeah.